Wrestling fans, are you ready? Yes! 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 For the thousands in attendance and the millions watching around the world, uh, let's get ready to rumble! Now, please welcome at this time your hosts, Graham, GSM Matthews, and RJ Marceau. You're listening to the next era of wrestling radio. This is Wrestle Rant Radio. Back in WrestleRant Radio for July 11th, 2024. Coming off a pretty eventful week in the world of wrestling. AEW Dynamite on Wednesday. But Money to Bank over the weekend. NXT Heat Wave Raw on Monday. Even some stuff on NXT on Tuesday. A lot of stuff going on on the road to SummerSlam in a few short weeks. As well as All In coming at the end of August. Mr. Marceau, brother, how you doing? How you digesting all of the wrestling from the past week? It feels like it's been a lot of it. Yeah, it's been a ton of it, but I'm doing well. Uh, I had a few days off last week and uh, with the holiday and... Just uh, a lot of wrestling, like you said. Hey, not bad. Not not bad to have a couple of days off before a weekend full of wrestling. I'm kind of wrestling out, which, which it, it is very odd for me to say, but we had Money in the Bank on Saturday, Heat Wave on Sunday, like I said. A lot of wrestling after that as well. I'm glad there is no pay-per-view this weekend, because Forbidden Door was the weekend before that, so I'm like kind of good on wrestling for, for a little while. Um, but it's a good thing, though, because, listen, a lot of these shows, pretty much all these shows that I'm talking about, were really, really good, including Dynamite on Wednesday, which I'll get to a little bit later on. But a lot of WWE news and notes to get to here. We'll start out with the most obvious, that being the Money in the Bank pay-per-view from last Saturday. Sounds like old news at this point, but overall, I thought it was a very good show uh, with some pretty crazy matches, some cool moments, and a uh, you know solid six-man tag team main event. A Money in the Bank cash-in that both of us will have some thoughts on. Before then, though, new episodes of WrestleRant Radio every single Thursday. WrestleRant.com, WrestleRantRadio.com. All the usual podcast platforms. Rate the show, review the show, subscribe to the show. Never miss a new episode every single Thursday, including for rants on Money in the Bank cash-ins that I thought was a waste. But, you know, we all have differing opinions. We'll get into that a little bit later on. I know you were kind of on the same mindset as I am, but we'll save that for a little bit later on uh, for the World Heavyweight Championship match. But kicking off the show, Mr. Marceau, we did have the Men's Money in the Bank ladder match, won by Drew McIntyre, also involving Andrade, Carmelo Hayes, Jay Uso, LA Knight. It was a pretty stacked lineup. Ended up being a great Money in the Bank ladder match. Um, a lot of these matches kind of blend together because we get so many ladder matches nowadays, but I thought this was an entertaining one, so just want to get your thoughts, and we'll get to the McIntyre cash in a little bit later on, like I said, but just want to get your thoughts on the match itself and the fact that McIntyre won. It was a solid match, I thought. Um, they had some good spots. They go over over the top of the furniture, I felt like. Uh, some good spots off the top of the ladder. Uh, then Andrade, I think he was, I don't know if he was on the tooker, like the... Uh, the flip off the top, off the ladder. I think it was on Hayes. It looked brutal. Um, when it came down, they kind of gave you the, the Jey Uso tease. He was on the top of the ladder, and then Drew came out of camera and hit him with the ladder. Drew climbs, wins the briefcase. Overall, I thought, like we discussed last week, I thought it was either Drew or Jay were going to win. Drew, Drew, I guess they kind of tease us with, Jew, mm-hmm. with Drew, uh, Jay. Oh, my God, I can't speak. <laughs> but uh, we got Drew winning here. I mean, like I thought him and Jay were the only ones that made sense. Um, so at that point, I was happy Drew won. Uh, was a little nervous what would happen later on in the show, um, but overall, I thought it was a good match. And at the time, I was happy Drew won. Yeah, I mean, I was hoping that we would get a surprise win from Jey Uso. When I say surprise, because he made sense, and we talked about it last week as to why I thought Drew would win, and the reason why he won is exactly what ended up happening a little bit later on, which, <clears throat> like I said, we'll get to when we talk about the World Heavyweight Championship match. But I was still holding out hope for Jey Uso, thinking. Man, this guy really hasn't won much of no in the last couple of months. I guess if you include the Mania match with Jimmy Uso, I guess you can include that. But beyond that, really hasn't done much of anything in the past um, six, seven months. I mean, he failed in the semifinals of the King of the Ring tournament, failed to win the World Heavyweight Championship at Backlash. He failed to win the Intercontinental Championship earlier this year. I'm thinking, surely he can win the Men's Money in the Bank ladder match. And then he fell short. We'll talk more about Jey Uso in the Raw review a little bit later on. But he did fall short to Drew McIntyre's arch-rival. 
and that was the uh, outcome here. I did think the match was great, though. Like you said, a lot of uh, crazy spots here, and it was enjoyable for what it was, and it was a pretty uh, solid match overall to kick off the show. So there was another note about the match I wanted to bring up, but I don't remember what it was. Ellie Knight... Oh, here's the other thing I wanted to mention. What we talked about last week... I think we were making not only predictions for the match, but, like, who could get involved. I think the most surprising part about the match itself was not the fact that it was good, was not the fact that Drew McIntyre won. It was the fact that we got no interference. That shocked me, which is not a bad thing, but I thought we might get the Wyatt Six to take out Gable or Jey Uso. I thought we might get, surely, Logan Paul would get involved and cost um, LA Knight the victory or CM Punk costing Drew, which... Again, was safe for a little bit later on, but none of that actually happened. So, were you as surprised as I was that we got no interference in this matchup? Yeah, I was surprised. I mean, with later on in the show, like you said, with 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 Punk, and then I mean, even if you want to count the main event, obviously with the whole bloodline stuff. I mean, I think maybe they they knew they're going to have some interference later on, so they want to crush it to death. But yeah, it was very surprising. We got nothing. Even I mean, the women's owner I think could get any anyways, mm-hmm. but. I was surprised here we got nothing, which, like you said, not a bad thing, but maybe they just realized after they formatted the show and when they were formatting the show, we're going to have some interference later on. No need to, to overdo it here, so I, I, I appreciated that. Yeah, I didn't want to you know involve too many shenanigans here, which I appreciated, but I, I still suspect LA Knight will find out tomorrow on SmackDown, I'm sure, but I still suspect he's going to challenge uh, Logan Paul for the United States Championship at SummerSlam. He did pin him in that Money to Bank qualifier two weeks ago at MSG. They'll probably set that up tomorrow or the following week. Uh, speaking of mid-card belts, the Intercontinental Championship on the line for, I think, the third consecutive pay-per-view. Not fourth, but Mania was also on the line. Uh, a lot of Intercontinental Championship defenses on pay-per-view in the last couple of months, which is not a bad thing. They're doing a great job of maintaining the momentum the belt had while Gunther was champion. Now that Sami Zayn is champion, he's had some very nice matches with Chad Gable, Bronson Reed, now Braun Breaker. You can add this one to the list. Uh, really, really good match here. Easily Braun Breaker's best match since joining the main roster. Not really saying much. Braun Breaker's really had a majority of squashes so far, but uh, this was great stuff. He really rose up to Sammy's level. And then you talk about surprises, not just the fact that Braun Breaker lost. I was expecting him to win, but it was the fact that as we were talking about earlier and when this happened over text a couple days ago, that he lost clean. Clean as a sheet. Now, he's not damaged. He's not buried. We saw on Raw he's going to bounce back. Definitely get into their title opportunity. He beat the hell out of Sammy on Raw. Beat the hell out of Ilya Dragunov on Raw. So, again, he'll be perfectly fine. But it was the fact that he lost as clean as he did that definitely took both me and you by surprise. So I just want to get your thoughts on the match and the surprisingly uh, clean finish. Yeah, I thought this was overall a good match. Like you said, I'm, I'm looking at the card here, 13-minute, 15-second match. Not every great match has to be like a 20-minute, 30-minute class. So I'm glad they had a really good match and didn't overstay their welcome. I thought Braun looked good. Sammy sells great, as always, as a baby face. And the biggest takeaway, like you said, I just was pretty surprised how clean Braun lost. Obviously, he kind of redeemed himself on Raw. But, I mean, it wasn't like with the Gunther that he kind of had Sammy beat and was kind of being the cocky heel and kind of got, like, last-minute heroics from Sammy. Sammy just, I mean, mm-hmm. beat him clean with the Hoover kick, and, and then he moved on from there. So I know, I know some people are upset with that. I was a little surprised, but... Uh, Braun was able to get back his heat on Raw. So, no real complaints. Like you said, I thought it was a good, solid match. And uh, uh, no complaints keeping the IC title kind of reign strong. Like you said, it's very important. And I think Sammy's done a good good job doing that. Yeah, I think the feud was going to continue regardless who've walked out of this show as the champion. But I think it's safe to say Breaker will be champion either at SummerSlam or by SummerSlam, right? I would say it has to be either or. I'd, yeah. I'd, I'd wait till SummerSlam to do the title change, but... Uh, I mean, I think that's when you do it. Yeah, I think if you asked me a couple weeks ago, I would have done a four-way with Sheamus and Ludwig Kaiser involved as well. But Kaiser got hurt against Breaker a couple weeks ago. He injured his ribs. I think he mentioned that in his promo last week. He was not on Raw this week. I don't know how long he's going to be out for. I don't know what the recovery time for something like that is. Um, Maybe it's still possible. I'm not sure. But Ilya Dragunov got involved with break. I mean, he's faced Breaker before. They've been feuding on and off for a couple months now on the main roster, including in NXT as well um, last year. But, you know, they could do a triple threat with as well and have Ilya take the pin if they want to protect Sammy. Don't really need to protect Sammy. I mean, Sammy Zayn is Sammy Zayn. I mean, he could take a fucking loss, obviously. He's the ultimate underdog for a reason. But, um, you know, either way, I think the Breaker, I think Breaker will be champion by SummerSlam, like you said. I think I, I would do it at SummerSlam as well. 
But if they want to do it beforehand or on the Raw afterward, that's totally fine too. Now, the big talking point coming out of this pay-per-view, there was a lot that happened, obviously, that we'll uh, more so get to in a couple minutes. But John Cena making a surprise appearance. I guess it was reported earlier on in the day that Cena was in the area, that he might appear. I stayed away from that stuff. I actually did not see that until his music hit, so I thought that was a cool surprise. The third return that he's had in Money in the Bank since uh, 2021, if you include that show and last year as well. Uh, no in-ring competition on this show, but he did announce his retirement from in-ring competition in 2025. So, like we were talking about before we hit record here, they made it sound like on the show itself, during Money in the Bank, and they did this for a reason, because he was pretty heavily plugging the post-show press conference where he answered all the questions about what it's going to entail and when it's going to last and end and begin and all this other sort of stuff. So he kind of made it clear there. He made it sound like during the promo that he was going to have one more rumble one more chamber, and one more mania, which is true. That is true. But th- the way he kind of said it made it sound like, which you would expect him to, that he would have his final match at WrestleMania. Um, but that's actually not the case. He said during the post-show press conference, it will be his final mania, but that he'll be continuing to wrestle for the remainder of 2025. And he's looking around 30 to 40 dates. Now, that's not set in stone, but I would find it hard to believe if he said that. And he did not end up doing 30 to 40 dates. That's almost like every week. Not every week, but like close to every week or every other week. That's more than half the year. Now, that definitely includes, I'm sure, international tours, dark matches. And he said dates. He's not saying matches. So he could just be showing up on Raw to promote a match at the upcoming pay-per-view. He's not going to be wrestling every week uh, for a straight year. But that's still pretty good. I mean, that's better than having one Rumble match, one Chamber match, one Mania match. So, obviously, massive news. This is not a massive surprise. It's more so surprising when it's happening and that they set it up the way that they did. I like the way that they set it up. Um, But he has been saying in interviews publicly for a while now that he was closing, hoping to close down his career in WWE by the age of 50. He's currently 47. By next April, he's 48. So, he's kind of winding down a bit sooner than expected. But it's not as if his last few matches were anything uh, really worth writing home about. They weren't bad, but like the Theory match... A couple of the other matches he's had in the last couple of years were not great. Um, he's clearly not the same in-ring competitor he was even five years ago. But I think this is a perfect way for him to uh, close out one of the greatest careers of all time. So, a lot to digest here, a lot to talk about. But just want to get your initial impressions, Mr. Marceau, of John Cena announcing his retirement in 2025. Yeah, I didn't see any of the uh, like headlines or any kind of spoilers before, so I was a little bit surprised. That's how Cena saw the whole, like, last time is now or whatever, like, you can't see me when the door closes, whatever the hell, Mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, I'm not the biggest Cena guy. So to me, I was like, what are we doing here? He's like, Oh, I'm the last match. like, okay. But then it kind of dragged it out a little bit longer. Said he was going to kick some ass in Toronto. Then he just left. Um, but I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm glad he's going to have some kind of little farewell tour. Um, you mentioned it before that he hasn't had the greatest matches in recent memory. So we'll see who he works with, what he does. Um, but, I mean, I guess it's kind of like that old player again, their farewell tour. This is our Cena farewell tour and hopefully makes the best of it. Um, hopefully it's not like forgettable matches and no one ever recalls. So, nice to see Cena here. Hopefully it's worth some sort of substance. I don't think he had much. I didn't really care for this theory match. I don't think it could be any worse than that. So, we'll see what he does. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it was interesting. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, the theory match was indeed underwhelming and we talked about it at the time not even just the match itself but the fact that did absolutely nothing for Austin Theory and that doesn't fall really on Cena at all that's entirely on WWE the lack of aftermath and fallout and follow up with Austin Theory Uh, Cena the only issue that I would have with him on that front was that he did Theory no favors with that promo on Raw that you were there weren't you there for that promo in Boston or no I was yeah you were there for that promo where he completely like the biggest burial I have seen in a promo in a very long time, if if not ever. It certainly ranks high up there. And Theory was, you know, certainly exposed in that moment. And it would be another thing, it also falls on Theory, if he were to rise to the occasion and prove people wrong. He was recently one half of the WWE Tag Team Champions, but beyond that, he really hasn't done much to prove people wrong about those criticisms that, you know, Cena had of him in early 2023. But nonetheless, hopefully Theory is not among the retirement tour, unless Cena wants to get his win back on a quick SmackDown. That's totally fine. I would have him wrestle on Raw. I would have him wrestle on SmackDown. 
he did mention during the post-show press conference, he approached WWE with the idea to do this sort of retirement tour, but it was WWE who said 2025 would make the most sense. Between, you know, Mania being in Vegas, that's going to be a massive show for them. And then they also have the Netflix deal. They want to, you know, time it with that. I would have to imagine he'll be in action on that first show on Netflix if they really want to load up that first Netflix show. I don't know if it's the first Monday in January in 2025 or if it's coming out of the Rumble. I think it's the first Monday of 2025. If I had to take a guess uh, from them leaving USA, going over to Netflix, uh, we'll get to the possible opponents in a moment. But the biggest question is, Mr. Marceau, that people are wondering, does he chase number 17, his 17th record-setting in WWE's eyes, Ric Flair has really won more than 16 world titles. But in their eyes, he's won more titles than anyone in WWE history, outside of the company and whatnot. Does he beat that number and become a 17-time world champion, or at least chase it? Or what else do you really do with Cena in the remainder of his time in the ring? Do you do stories? Do you do feuds? Is it like an open challenge type thing? What would you like to see Cena do in his final few months and in, in, in the last year of his career? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean... I'm not really, like, down for a Cena championship run. I mean, I guess he could chase. I don't know if it's definitely necessary. Um, I guess with the world championship, depending on who's holding it, it doesn't totally matter. Um, but overall, I'm not, like, weighing on a Cena title reign. But I guess depending on who's holding the belt, I guess you could probably convince me, depending on how it's going. But uh, besides that, like I said, what else does he really do, though? I feel like... I mean, he's just going to have random feuds of people. And like I said, with the whole theory thing, it's not, I think, like I said, that the whole promo didn't really help theory out. And kind of, I mean, he was literally saying, even if you beat me, you're going to be no one. And kind of came true. But, I mean, I think if he's going to put over young talent, that's the only thing else I could see. But, like, I feel like he'll maybe do some other kind of matches with maybe some people he's had history with, or in Punk, maybe. So, we'll see. I mean, I'm not against it but i think depending on the circumstance it makes sense but i don't think it definitely needs to happen either does john cena win the royal rumble and go on to wrestlemania challenge for a world championship i hope not <laughs> let's look at the landscape right now I, I think cody rhodes at this point will probably be wwe champion still by wrestlemania i think gunther becomes champion at SummerSlam. they'll probably both be champions until mania i could honestly see cena facing cody or i mean i think cody's probably facing rock but I could see Cody and Cena at some point. I could see Cena and Gunther. Both are fresh matches. And um, I don't know if Cena needs to be headlining either of those shows. I, I think Cena's last Mania match in and of itself is an attraction. I don't know if he needs to be challenging for the championship on that show. But I, I think that's a possibility, though. I wouldn't completely discount that. Yeah, it's possible. I just, I mean, I don't think, like I said, I, I guess my thing is I don't think he needs to like, beat Gunther for the belt. I, I don't need to see that in 2025. Um, I mean, gives me Rusev vibes, honestly. But uh, <laughs> I mean, if, if needed, I guess so. But like I said, I, I'm I'm more focused on the future. Love you, John. But let's worry about the future and not worry about retired old people that, at this point, don't need to be winning holding title belts. Well, I'm hoping he faces as many fresh faces and familiar foes as possible. But also, like, not losing every match. When you lose every match, then it's like it doesn't really mean anything for um, these younger people to beat John Cena. So he should probably win at least half, if not more, of his matches. And like I said, I, I joke about the Theory thing, but it would make sense for him to run it back with Theory, beat Theory, not, maybe not necessarily on a pay-per-view, but on a SmackDown. Yeah, I mean, but Theory is seemingly going face. So I, I was, I I was just about to say, yeah. I, that, that's they probably isn't like that. Even happen. Hey, maybe they can team up. Hey, hey, listen, maybe he can endorse him that way by teaming up the same way that he, uh, you know... Uh, put over L.A. Knight by not facing him and beating him or losing to him, but rather teaming up at that Fastlane show or whatever pay-per-view it was um, late last year. So, yeah, that, that's certainly a possibility. But he should probably win a majority of his matches, so it actually means something when he does lose. Um, I mean, he'll, he'll probably wrestle, like I said, a majority of house shows. I don't expect him to wrestle every week. I don't know if he's going to wrestle at every pay-per-view. He did say Chamber, Rumble, and Mania, so we know that. He did tease Money in the Bank as well. I don't necessarily need to see a Cena World Championship run. But if it was done right, not really a mania specifically, but coming out of mania for a couple months, that might work out. But we don't know what the landscape will look like in a year from now, so who's really to say? Um, I mentioned this on Hashtag on Wednesday, but would you also like to see Cena get his own 
show, um, like an event dedicated to his final match? Because there's no pay-per-view in December. There might be this year. I don't think there will be. I mean, the Rumble's not until February 1st now, so I guess they might have to. I don't know. Um, but th- we're talking about 2025 here. Could they just televise the MSG house show, the Boston house show that you were at last year? I could see them televising that, making that Cena's last match. What would you like to see them do for Cena's final match, whether it be on Raw or a pay-per-view or just make up their own show for him? Yeah, I mean, I think regardless of whatever it is, it should be obviously televised, something on either TV, Peacock, whatever. Not sure exactly what you do with them, but like you said, it should be like its own dedicated event for him, regardless if it's a Raw SmackDown house show. It should be like video packs throughout, kind of the best of Cena. And him at obviously main event thing, and it's the last time we see Big Match John in the ring. So I, I would go all out, but definitely should be televised, marketed, everything. Yeah, no, he shouldn't just you know go out with a whimper with a match on a just a house show, which would be cool for the people in attendance. But they really should televise that. But final question on the Cena front, going back to what you mentioned earlier, as far as people he could face. We mentioned the theory thing; maybe they team up. You mentioned Orton, Punk. Is there anyone specifically? Uh, you can name a couple. Familiar rivals of his, as well as new people that you might... I mean, again, Cena at this point in the ring is not the same Cena of 5, 10 years ago, even 15 years ago, whatever. So, again, it's it's not exactly the Cena instant... It's, it's not Big Match John anymore. Let's put it that way. It's not the open challenge John from 10 years ago. But that being said, people you would like to see mix it up with or mix it up with for the first time. Yeah, I mean, I think we'll probably get him in solo again. I assume it's the last person we saw him in the ring with. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, obviously, so it killed him. Maybe I don't really need to see Cena beat him, but we should probably get that. Uh, he was involved in WrestleMania, so I don't know. Maybe him and Dwayne, maybe. Uh, okay. Roman. I don't know. We'll see what happens there. Um, I'm trying to think who else. I think, I think him and Theory, if they turn Theory face, maybe like I said, doing him teaming up and Cena kind of endorsing him there to kind of maybe help him out on the baby face front. Um, that would be nice. Like I said, him and Orton, Cena, or him and Punk. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to think who else. I, I mean, you can do him and Cody. I mean, yeah. I don't need to see it, but I think that'd be fun. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Him and Rollins, maybe. I know him and Rollins had a little, I mean, SummerSlam 2015. Yep. great match. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's endless opportunities, so I think you kind of just use what you have and try to get as much eyes on the prize as you can and he said, don't just be seen to death, but pick spots and maybe put some people over and still kind of show the best of Cena. So we'll see. I think it's a great opportunity for both of them, and they can sell a lot of red T-shirts and towels and hats. So <laughs> I'll probably have to buy one. I said this on Twitter, but I actually don't own in my 16 years of fandom because I was never a fan of the, the fucking coloring box of uh, T-shirts that he's always had. I never owned a John Cena shirt, like a singular... Cena shirt, I have shirts with him on it, but not a John Cena shirt. So, might have to get that uh, My Time Is Up. If we're at a show that he's on or something like that, like in Boston or whatever. I mean, I'm sure he's going to be coming to the Northeast at some point in 2025. So, might have to get one. But I'll throw four names at you. One being AJ Styles. You mentioned Rollins, and they had great chemistry. Um, I would love to see Cena and Styles one more time. They always had amazing matches back in 2016, 2017. Uh, fresh opponent here. I'm surprised we haven't gotten it yet, but it just hasn't worked out time-wise. Cena and Logan Paul, I feel like it'd be a really fun match. I know Logan Paul wants that match. He's talked about that match before. I think he even told Triple H, I think a year ago, I think he, like, texted him or something. He said this on his podcast, that he wanted Cena at Mania, and it just didn't work out because Cena faced Theory, and he faced Seth Rollins, which was a great match. But I think Logan Paul and Cena would be great. Um, I mentioned Gunther. It doesn't have to be for the championship. I don't really want to see Cena beat Gunther. I feel like that's sacrilegious. That would just be dumb. <laughs> so I don't really want to see that. Um, especially when Gunther is all about like the prestige of the sport, and then he loses to like this fucking washed-up John Cena. <laughs> that would just be silly. <laughs> so no thanks, but I do want to see that match, even if Gunther kills him. And then finally, I think him and Breaker would be a really good match to do, too. They had that quick face-off on NXT. I think when NXT was live... I mean, NXT is always live. But they were live against Dynamite back in October. And... Oh, the time that Cena and Undertaker were on the show, they didn't draw a million people? No, yes. Sure. <laughs> and they beat Dynamite? Yes. Oh, we did a million people. Yeah, because you had Cody Rhodes, Cena, and The Undertaker on your fucking developmental show. But, um, yes, exactly. When Cena confronted Breaker on that show, they kind of planted the seed. Then, 
I wouldn't mind seeing that match at some point down the road. So we'll see what they have in store. Um, I'm excited for it. I think this is a great idea as opposed to just doing one more match, one more feud. Kind of gives everyone a chance to see him in person one, one more time. It's going to do big business for them, which they tout all the time, obviously, and rightfully so. Uh, justifiably so. And I think that's going to be a, a big year for WWE with Cena's retirement tour culminating in December 2025. Back to Money in the Bank. we got to talk about this World Heavyweight Championship match. I really liked the match. I thought Priest and Rollins had a very good match together. Um, Rollins looked, I don't know, whatever for reason, for whatever reason to me, he looked a little slower than usual. I don't know if it was ring rust or whatever. It looked like he was wrestling in slow motion at certain points, but... That's not to say he had a bad performance. That was just a minor nitpick. But overall, I really liked the match. And then, uh, obviously, as we kind of expected, Drew McIntyre came out, cashed in, turned into a triple threat. McIntyre gets attacked by Punk. McIntyre gets pinned by Damian Priest. So this went down the way that I thought it might. And I'm not, that's not to say I'm proud of that. I am not a fan of how this went down. A uh, lot of divisive opinion on this, Mr. Marceau. And I understand the other side of it. I do. But that does not change my mind that I thought this was a waste of the briefcase. And I've already talked about it a lot, so I'll throw it to you and we'll kind of go back and forth. But what do you think of the cash and the match itself? The match itself I thought was good. Like you said, I think Raw obviously, like you said, Ronson seemed like he was his normal self. But, I mean, he was also coming back from some knee issues and mm-hmm. knee surgery, whatever happened, procedures. And, like, first time, first match back out there. So I didn't expect, like... The normal on, so I still thought it was a solid match before Drew came out. I liked how they kept teasing, like looking at the uh, entranceway. They weren't like caught off guard, like "What the hell, Drew's out here?" He's been saying it for months. So, like, I'm glad they kind of acknowledged that. Like, they both kept like picking their spots, like "Oh, is he coming out?" And they might have caught them at the wrong time, and the other person took over. So I thought that was good storytelling there. Drew came out. I mean, I, I under <laughs> like you said, I understand the other side of it. I just don't think you needed to blow the briefcase an, an hour and 20 minutes later when mm-hmm. Drew cashed it in and lost. And I know what people are saying. Oh, you know, that's more heat than Drew and Punk. I mean, they both basically killed each other. At this point, I don't really know what else you really need to, like, hype that feud up. So, like, I don't really understand that point. Like, oh, and more heat for that feud. Like, they literally basically killed each other. He's cost Drew the belt twice already. Did he really need to do it again? And two, people like, well, you know, this sets up him and Rollins again. They already were going to do that before Punk got hurt. So, like, you can kind of just rehash that. You don't mm-hmm. need him to cost Rollins the belt either. Like, yeah, it's nice storytelling. It can, like, you can kind of put in your cap and be like, oh, yeah, he did this too. But, like, we were going to get that match regardless at WrestleMania, but Punk got hurt. So, you can kind of just get there without doing it again. Like, you don't need to cost the briefcase. You don't need to do that. I know, like, what people say, like, well, that's a nice, nice little add-on, but they already were going to fight before Punk got hurt, so you could have just rehashed that without another reason of not blowing the briefcase. Especially for how quick it was. Like I said, it was like, I don't know if someone had like a stopwatch, but it had to be within the, within an hour. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. get it, but I just think it's stupid. So what people were saying was, and again, I understand the other side of it, like you said, and it, it, it's not a waste, it is a waste, but it's not a waste in the sense that, like you said, and like people have talked about it, it furthered the feud with Punk and um, McIntyre going into SummerSlam. I get that. But like I texted you, I would have had less of an issue with this if we didn't already see a similar angle at WrestleMania in Clash of the Castle a fucking month ago, where he already cost him the World Heavyweight Championship. Now, it does go back to what Punk said at the presser last month after Clash, where he said, you know, as long as there's uh, air in my lungs, I'm going to make sure McIntyre's never world champion again, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, he lived up to his word. But then let me ask you this, though. If Punk, from a storyline standpoint, is all about, you know, elevating talent and wanting to see other people do well and, and whatever, which he's talked about before. He's buddy-buddy with Jey Uso on the show. We've seen that before coming out of WrestleMania. Why wouldn't he just cost McIntyre the briefcase as opposed to costing him the, the fucking title shot itself? Like, why not cost him the briefcase and allow someone else to get that opportunity, whether it's Carmelo or Andrade, specifically LA Knight or Jey Uso? That just didn't really make a whole lot of sense to me. So I know why they did it, like, from a booking standpoint, so Rollins wouldn't have to get pinned and whatever, but I just thought that was silly. He could have just cost him the briefcase. Um, but what people have said, though, is is that we just had Damian Priest as Mr. Money in the Bank for 8, 9, 10 months, cashed in at Mania, 
And if Jey Uso were to win or anyone else in that match, they're not cashing in until after Mania because Gunther is about to become champion. No one's going to cash in on him successfully in the next six to nine months, I don't think. No one's going to cash in on successfully on Cody Rhodes in the next six to nine months until after Mania. Does that like does that bother you if they were to have another long reigning Mr. Money in the Bank? It does. It doesn't to me. I don't really see that being an issue. I just feel like that's people grasping at straws that we can't have another nine month reigning Money in the Bank, or people don't like the Money in the Bank concept so much they can't bear to see someone with a briefcase for the next nine months. I, it's not that I love the briefcase, but I felt like they just could have done more with that. I mean, I get where they're coming from, but I just also think, yeah, like you just had someone hold it for a year. Does that mean the next person on Wednesday has to hold it for an hour? I mean, yeah. You have a happy medium. I mean, I, I, I just feel like, like I said, I feel, I understand that, like you, people are saying, like it wasn't a total waste, it, it furthered their feud. But like I said, and you mentioned it, he's already cost him the belt twice, so he did it a third time. I mean, Jesus Christ. If, if I was. Drew McIntyre would run over CM Punk with a bulldozer. Like, this guy just can't, like, I need to get rid of him. He just keeps costing me title matches. Like, I just, I don't think it's worth, it wasn't worth the briefcase sacrifice and the briefcase to further a few that already had a ton of heat. That's my thing. Like, yes, yeah. it did serve a purpose, but the feud has already had so much heat, you didn't have to do it here. And yeah. people are like, oh, but Will Rollins, it, um, to me, it does, like, the feud was already there. You didn't need to cost him the belt either. Right? No, I like, agree. I feel like yeah. that's something that they're trying to like add on. Like, look what we're doing. But at the end of the day, it really didn't need to happen. I just don't really think it's a problem if they were to have, again, Jay Uso win it or, or whatever. Um, if they were to have Jay Uso win it, I, I don't really think it would have made much of a difference if they had him and Tiffany holding briefcases at the same time. Like, people are making it sound like it would be an issue or it would be too much if you had two Money in the Bank winners simultaneously then just don't do both men's and women's money in the bank ladder like i don't really know what people expect just because that is that the reason why they had the women cash in on the same night for fucking four years straight like is that why they did that because they don't want a man and a woman holding a briefcase simultaneously like with jay uso specifically i feel like he would have been the perfect winner night would have been fine but he's about to win the united states championship so that's probably why he didn't win it but with Jay, though, I, I was going back and forth with someone who said, oh, he wouldn't hold the briefcase if he was fe- with, you know, feuding with the bloodline. Why not? I don't understand why, why not. I mean, he's not going to cash in, but he could tease cashing in on Cody. They have history. I mean, I know they're friends, but what if Jay wanted to become champion and go over to SmackDown? I don't know. There's a lot of different directions they could have gone with it. I felt like they took the most predictable path. It was logical, yes, but it was also just really lazy. I don't know. I just, I also, here's the other issue, too. If they didn't already have, what, four, at least four, if not five other winners in the past seven years that completely wasted the briefcase, and this was like the first time, like when they did it with Cena like a decade and a half ago, when he wasted it, cashed in on Punk in an announced match, and they lost by DQ, that was incredibly fucking stupid. But they had never had anyone lose before, so it's like, okay. But like in recent years alone, dude, the Corbin thing was awful. The Braun Strowman cash-in, if you can even call it that, was terrible. The Brock one was a waste. He didn't need that. The Otis one, I mean, how far are we going here? The Theory one was terrible. You know what I mean? Like, they've already wasted the briefcase enough. I think the Priest one kind of restored people's excitement for the concept, at least on the men's side. And then they flushed it right down the toilet by having Drew lose. And I'm not even saying he should have cashed in successfully. He should just he should just not have won at all, in my opinion. No, yeah, I completely agree. I think him winning and losing it was not necessary. Someone else could, like you said, Drew, people saying like, oh, Jay didn't need it. Like they said, even if though he's friends with Cody, he could still like play like, oh, he really wants to win the championship. Yeah. Or like tease like, oh, so he has it over Solo's head and that's kind of like, oh, if you win the belt, I can just take it right from you. If he beats Cody at SummerSlam or something like that, like you might be the tribal chief, but I can take that belt right off if you win it. Like, I don't know. Like, I feel like that's, like, that's better storytelling than just Drew losing it in fucking 58 minutes. <laughs> Yeah, it would be. Just the way they took with it again. Like like you said, that was my exact thought. And he has nothing, and just to go back to Jay, he hasn't, like you said, you mentioned it before, he hasn't won anything of note since he beat his brother at WrestleMania in a forgettable match, and at least if he had the briefcase, he had something to hold his hat on. Like, he has nothing. He's, 
I mean, we don't really know what he's doing next. Hopefully not this Wyatt Six garbage. But besides that, like, what else are you going to do with him in the meantime? That was my next question. I was going to say, I'm not my next question. I was going to save it for later on, but I'll ask you right now. We talked about it last week, and I asked you or said to you I could see the Wyatt Six costing him the briefcase. Thankfully, that did not happen. He still lost, but it wasn't as if the Wyatt Six got involved. He did face Gable on Raw, and they were involved with that, but, I mean, they didn't go after Jay. There's still no indication they're going to attack Jay. I still feel like it's possible. Gable's still, like, the target, it seems like. What would you do next with Jay? Because I don't think he goes for the Intercontinental title. I mean, I think he should, but he's not going to beat Sammy because Braun's about to beat Sammy. Maybe he could beat Braun in six months. I mean, I, I don't I honestly literally do not know at this point unless it's a Wyatt Six feud, which I don't even hate the idea. I know you don't like the idea, and that's fine. I don't love the idea, but I can see it making sense. I honestly don't know what more you do with him unless he reunites with Jimmy in the, in the foreseeable future. And even then, I don't love that because I feel like that's a waste of Jay's current popularity. Yeah, I mean, I just, I don't even know what you do with him. That's why I was kind of like hoping he would win here because I feel like that made more sense. Him facing the Wyatt Six, I mean, I, one doesn't entertain me at all. Two, I mean, theoretically, both people would need to win. I mean, obviously, that wouldn't happen. I mean, I just don't. And then if he loses, then what do you go from there? He's just a loser who can't beat anyone. And then what do you do with him? So I, I just feel like that's why you need the briefcase, just because I feel like, one, even if you did the whole wide six thing, which I don't think you need to, I think he'd have something regardless. He could even show up on SmackDown. Like I said, even though he's friends with Cody, he could kind of like mix him in with the bloodline starting there. And then when Rome comes back, kind of integrate him more because that's seemingly where it's going to go. But I don't know. I just, the whole Wyatt Six thing, I feel like he needs to win to keep his popularity and credibility. But if he's facing them, it's highly unlikely he's going to win. Because if he beats them, then they're just, they're just like, you bring this new group and they lose instantly, and it's mm-hmm. just dumb. Yeah, no, I'm liking what they're doing with the Wyatt Six personally. I thought what we got on Raw was cool. They did further it. And I mean, it wasn't as if it was the same thing as the week before. They did reveal their identities. I mean, officially. I know, again, we already know who they are, but. Um, I thought they did a nice job with that. We did see Bo Dallas in Adam Pierce's office. So, I mean, they did further it again on that front as well. Um, I don't know what that means. If he's looking to have a match, if he's going to wrestle as Bo Dallas, I would think so. And not necessarily in the mask. I like that. But I mean, I had seen someone say on the J front, someone had made the comparison and I honestly agree with this. I feel like he's this modern day from like 15 years ago, Jeff Hardy, where he's just so fucking over and people will love him no matter what. But the difference, the only difference, though, I think, is that even Jeff Hardy in 08, like, yeah, he lost to Randy Orton when he went for the world title, and he lost so many world title opportunities, but he did eventually win, though. And I've always said, like, I don't really see Jay as, like, a long-time main event player as a world champion, but I'm not saying he needs to win the world title, but at least Jeff Hardy had several intercontinental title runs, or, you know, he, he won at least a couple different titles. Jay Uso hasn't won shit. I mean, he was tag team champion for a month, uh, six months ago with Cody Rhodes, but that was it. I mean, he hasn't really done much beyond that, so I, I'm still stumped. I really don't know what you do. And the Wyatt Six stuff, I, I guess, but I don't see him escaping that with a win, so I'm kind of confused. I, I, I think Jimmy might be coming back to kick that whole thing off, but uh, and that's cool and all, but I just don't know. I just feel like that's a waste of his popularity, like I said, so I don't really know where they go with him. I mean, like you said, I said, I, I mean, I think the Jeff Hardy comparison, like you said, is... is pretty on point a tag team guy it's extremely over people love him but you kind of nailed the head on you nailed the nail on the head there he you know he actually won something of note to like actually continue his popularity i just like you said jay's one legit jack shit that make anyone even care about him i don't know he's still over it no idea how but <laughs> i mean like you said eventually you need to win something and i mean him going back with jimmy i feel like we're just yeah, they'd be very popular if they're a tag team. It's not like the tag team division really means a ton right now, but I, I, I just, I, I just, I don't know. I mean, eventually it's going to go lead back to the bloodline because that's seemingly where it's going. But I think him winning something on his own would, would help. It'd be nice for the fans, and it'd actually help solidify him as a singles player. I mean, yeah, he's main event Jey Uso, but he hasn't won a match that means a lick. Yeah, I mean, he really hasn't. Uh... I mean, done much at all. Even, I mean, I know LA Knight was in a similar boat for a while, but it looks like, like I said, he's about to win the United States Championship, so he has that to hang his hat on. Jey Uso doesn't. I don't think he's involved in the IC title picture anytime soon, so they got to figure that shit out. 
Um, Tiffany Stratton winning the women's Money in the Bank ladder match. Another crazy match. I thought it started pretty rough. Like, there were a lot of botched spots. Uh, I, I know the men's match wasn't perfect either, but like the women's one specifically early on, they had a lot of botched spots, but they recovered very well with doing some crazy shit, which they shouldn't always have to do. Same thing with the men, but they just insist on it. Like that Michinoku driver off the ladder from Io Sky and Zoe Stark was fucking crazy. Um, Chelsea Green, to her credit, nailing that table spot. And typically when they do that sort of shit, they completely miss. Like they always miss or it doesn't look good. They break one table. She flush went through both of them. Um, that was really well done. And then Tiffany obviously winning as she should have. That was the right winner. So uh, thoughts in the match, Mr. Marceau and Tiffany Stratton. That's uh, Tiffy time with uh, Miss Money in the Bank. Yeah, I thought this was a great match. You said a lot of hard spots, like hard hitting. And I thought they all came off and looked well. Um, like you said, the Michinuka drive by Io was crazy. Uh, Zoe, I think Zoe hit Lyra with them. I think she kind of did like a... Kind of like a power bomb on Lyra on the ladder looked brutal. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I said, the they kind of did the similar thing with the men. Like they teased, oh, Chelsea's going to win. And then she went flying through the tables. We said, perfect table spot. I mean, how often do you see a flush table spot like that? You Like I said, usually they miss or they like kind of hit one of them and like seemingly almost mess themselves up. But she flush went right through both tables. Looked literally perfect. And then Tiffy was there to to win the briefcase. I mean, people calling, oh, so predictable. I don't give a shit. She was predictable, and she should have won it. I'm glad she did. So, uh, it's Tiffy time. It'll add some intrigue to Bailey and Nia. Um, I thought it was the right winner, which I don't know why. All of a sudden, that's not the right thing. Like, you need to predict that. <laughs> if it's predictable, it doesn't yeah. mean it's not good. So, but, I mean, I-, I loved it. So, no complaints here. I thought they all looked good. Great spots. Seemingly, everyone's healthy after, and I thought the right person won. I agree. I don't think Tiffany needs to cash in anytime soon. If you just had Drew cash in the same night and lose, uh, obviously Tiffany should win for, you know, for starters. And then second of all, I think she should probably hold off. And like you said, it does add intrigue to Bailey versus Nia. Um, she could get involved. I certainly would not have her get involved in the match itself. Like, we literally just saw that with the men, so I wouldn't even do that. Uh, and I'm not even really sure what the point would be either, because if, like... She would have to pin Bailey. She's not pinning Nia Jax, I wouldn't think. So, um, yeah, maybe Bailey beats Nia and then she cashes in on Bailey. I would rather just see her hold on to it for a while. I think Nia is probably becoming champion. And you know we're in a weird ass timeline. What I'm going to say, I honestly wouldn't mind seeing that. Because I think Nia, like I've said to you before in the last year, has actually had a pretty good run since coming back to the company. So if they give her a token title run on SmackDown, that's fine by me. Maybe Tiffany cashes in on her down the road. No complaints there. So. Um, yeah, I like that Tiffany won. Like you said, the predictability of it. Who gives a shit? Um, same thing with the main event. I'm not really sure what people expected. Solo Sokoa pinning Cody Rhodes in the six-man tag team match. Bloodline beating Rhodes, Orton, and Owens. Uh, a pretty good match. It wasn't like an amazing match. They picked up the pace down the stretch. Uh, pretty standard stuff. It felt like a TV match early on, but they were getting heat on Bloodline, so what do you expect, really? I think my biggest issue with this was that not the finish or even the match itself, it's that if they were going to do this, I probably would have closed with the world title stuff personally. Um, just kind of made for a flat finish to the show. But it does set up Solo to challenge Cody Rhodes at SummerSlam for the Undisputed WWE Championship. And Jacob Fatu got some time to shine. He looked great. Uh, didn't get to do too much in there, but like the whisper in the wind spot, completely no-selling Orton's uh, whatever you would call it, the draping DDT spot was fucking awesome. So he shined here. But overall, I thought the match was good and the ending was exactly what it needed to be. But uh, your thoughts, Mr. Marceau, and what this sets up for the future? Yeah, like you said, I'm not really sure what people expected. Uh, people, uh, uh, predictable. Well, I mean, Solo's going to face Cody at, at SummerSlam. He kind of had to beat him. It wasn't like he beat him clean. So people complaining, oh, Cody's already losing. Like, they literally cheated to beat him. I mean, Jesus <laughs> Christ. <Yeah. laughs> this is fucking wrestling one-on-one, people. What are you bitching about? But, I mean, I thought, like you said, was it the greatest match ever? No, but I thought... It was well done. I mean, the Tonga Lois spot will live in infamy. Guy can't even hit a low blow. <laughs> that was, yeah, that was funny. Poor Tonga Lois. Yeah, holy Ugh, shit. I mean, send him back to Camacho. I just, I just see him on the fucking the, the bicycle. But uh, <laughs> like I said, I thought it was good. a good little match. I thought Fatu looked great. Solo, I feel like he's kind of getting more and more over. Needed the win here to kind of set up him and Cody, give him more heat. If, I mean, be Kevin Owens or Randy really would have made sense. Um so I'm glad he won here. 
kind of furthermore like how good the bloodline is, how powerful it is, how good Solo is. So I think storyline wise made sense. I mean, no issues here. I just I don't know. People just complain and complain. I guess I don't know. Yeah. Thought it made sense and right for team one and. Obviously, it could have been a little bit cleaner at the end with a couple botches, but mm-hmm. solo winning was kind of what, what I already had figured out. So mm-hmm. No, I agree. Uh, no Roman Reigns return either, but like we said last week, I think at this point, if they're closing with Cody and Solo, which they probably should. I mean, we didn't really mention it, but Damian Priest retaining does set him up. I thought Rollins was winning. I know you picked Rollins too, I think, but um, uh, you know, Rollins or uh, and Gunther would have been a sexier main event for that show. I mean, I don't think that was ever going to close anyway. But we're getting Priest and Gunther. So I think that pretty much confirms, for the World Heavyweight Championship, So that pretty much confirms Cody and Solo is closing that show. I mean, there's not even a question. If this closed Money in the Bank, that match is closing SummerSlam. Which would, to me, mean, I don't think Cody wins clean, or and then the show's just over, which would be fine. I think Cody probably wins, and Roman Reigns returns. I feel like that's the safe bet at this point. Yeah, no, I think, I, th- I mean, I think it makes a ton of sense. Cody retains, maybe we have like a little bloodline beat down of Cody after the fact. Roman comes back. I mean, I think that's how you end the show. Yeah, I think it writes itself. Uh, we don't have to do a full-on review here, but just want to get your thoughts overall on NXT Heat Wave from uh, Sunday. Followed up on Money in the Bank, same arena in the Scotiabank Arena in Toronto. Listen, I tuned in, not really expecting much. Uh, and It ended up being a very good show, actually. This was probably one of, if not their best, NXT PLE all year so far. Um, some no no bad matches. I mean, the pre-show match was not great at all, but the five <laughs> matches on the main card were uh, very very good. Uh, Obafemi Wesley for the North American title was a fun opener. Kalani Jordan and Sol Ruka having a fun match. And yeah, was it a gymnastics meet? Yeah, but like so was everything I watched for the most part in AEW. So like Meltzer and those guys having an issue with it, I don't really know what to tell you. I mean, these people are still learning. They be, they even it was funny because they repeated a spot. I I think they did this intentionally. From Will Ospreay and Ricochet, their famous match from like six, seven years ago. And Meltzer had like, and I mean, again, his opinion is his opinion, obviously, so who gives a shit? But they were like, oh man, it just felt so choreographed. Yeah, it was choreographed, but so again, so is most of those matches that, that, that AEW does. And that's fun. I enjoy those matches. They're spot fests. That's what this was. But you got to call a spade a spade. I mean, that's what it was in AEW too, but... Anyway, that was good. The tag team title match was actually great. I was kind of shocked by how great that match was. Frazier and Axiom versus Chase U. Had no expectations for that. That was a really good match. Roxanne, Perez, and Sol Ruka. Uh, I wrote down Sol Ruka. Uh, Lola Vice was good for the NXT Women's title. And the four-way main event was actually fantastic. Ethan Page beating Javon Evans, Sean Spears, and the current champ, Trick Williams, to become the new NXT champion. So, uh, overall thoughts, Mr. Marceau, on uh, how NXT Heat Wave exceeded expectations this weekend. I thought it was a solid show. Like you said, I didn't have a huge expectation. Uh, I watched it live, and I thought overall it was a solid show. I felt, uh, like you said, I feel like the tag team match might have been the one that honestly probably stuck out most to me because I just didn't really have high hopes to be a fun match, and it actually pretty much was. It was probably one of my favorite matches of the night. So I thought all in all, all in all, a solid show. Uh, like I said, Jordan and Ruka, yeah, they had some spots clearly choreographed. I mean, they're both still very young and learning, so... I mean, it's going to happen, but I like Jordan. I like Ruka. I think they're bright. They both have bright futures. Uh, Roxanne and Lola was good. Roxanne looked, I thought Lola looked good. Roxanne, the savvier veteran, won there. And uh, the main event was good, and I called Ethan Page, so you're welcome. You did. You did call Ethan Page becoming champion, and I was happy to see it. I was not expecting it. I was uh, very happy to see that uh, title change at the end of the show. So not a lot of TNA presence. There was no TNA presence until the final two seconds when they had a Joe Hendry cameo. He popped up on Tuesday, teaming with Trick Williams. They had a Rascals reunion as well. Uh, Wesley reuniting with uh, Zachary Wentz, the former Nash Carter, and Trey Miguel from TNA on Tuesday. I know you're not a TNA guy, but just your thoughts on how the TNA crossover has gone so far. Because to me, I think they've done a great job. And I watch TNA, so I enjoy the TNA involvement as well. But it feels like it really is on both sides, as opposed to just being one-sided. I mean... NXT is getting more star power than TNA has so far, but I think so far it's uh, been pretty even, and I'm actually really enjoying it. It really has injected new life into the show. Yeah, it's definitely added on. I think they needed this, NXT did, for the sense that they kind of lost a lot of their big-time players, so adding in familiar faces with the Rascals who were with Wesley when he was in TNA, so the Joe Henry stuff was over. Um, I think it's been good, and I think adding in like Spears and, and Ethan Page... Like they're kind of veterans or people that we know 
has definitely helped on that front. So I think TNA or NXT is definitely benefited because they need it. They've kind of been washed out of talent, but hopefully they can uh, return the favor to TNA and give them something. Now, I hope so. Listen, Slammiversary is coming up in a couple weeks. That's going to be in Montreal. They were just in WWE was in Toronto for Heat Wave and Money in the Bank. But they're going to be in Montreal for Slammiversary in a couple weeks. And I tweeted this couple days ago, but the longer that AJ Styles is off TV, I know he's in Japan doing a Noah match this weekend with Mara Fuji or something like that. I don't watch Noah, but that sounds like a really good match. Um, the longer that he's off TV, it, it gives me confidence there is a chance that he either has a match or at least appears at Slammiversary. And if they play the old TNA Get Ready to Fly song, the CJ Miles, the marginal one, shows up. Um, AJ Styles shows up with that song. I, I, you will hear me jumping through a window. So I don't think it's going to happen, but anything's possible at this point. They're proving that, which is, which is really cool. But NXT is loading up. So they have the TNA crossover going on right now. They just hired Ethan Page. He's already the NXT champion. Just announced on Wednesday, kind of a crazy turn of events here. WWE NXT hiring Stephanie Vakir, the now former CMLL women's champion, the former New Japan Strong women's champion as well, just lost the belt to Mercedes Monet in a great match at Forbidden Door, having one of the better matches on the show. She made one collision appearance before that, a rampage or whatever, and um, then she wrestled at Forbidden Door, lost, I guess, WWE, I mean, she had a tryout a couple years ago, but she wasn't really ready yet, but it was clearly that match with Mercedes that kind of reminded them of how good she was, and put them on their radar, because they scooped her up immediately, to the point where she didn't even drop the belt in CMLL, they just fucking hired her. They vacated the belt, and WWE and Shawn Michaels announced it yesterday that they signed her. So, I mean, this was pretty crazy turn of events here. I know you don't know much about her, because I really don't either. I, all that I know about her is what AEW used her for in the month that they had her, but she impressed me Forbidden Door. But, again, from what you know about her in the situation, your thoughts on the signing, and how NXT really seems to be loading up their women's division right now. Yeah, I don't, like you said, I don't really know a ton about her. It gives me, like, Dragon Levi. Yes, like, exactly, like, yeah. For a hot second, yeah. and then NXT scooped him up as well. So, I mean, the women's division of NXT, I feel like, is pretty stacked already, or they have, like, a lot of up-and-coming women. So, adding another established name or someone that's been, like, on a main stage definitely shouldn't hurt. Um, I mean, Roxanne's kind of rocked the division, no pun intended, but, mm-hmm. um, I, I mean, it's funny that, they kind of like seemingly are picking, picking and choosing what they want. And uh, like I said, it gives me Dragon Lee vibes. Yeah, no, it was big Dragon Lee vibes. He appeared in AEW. It wasn't the very next week, but it was a couple months later where AEW didn't sign Dragon Lee for whatever reason. I don't know if they were going to bring him in. I don't know. But like the, you, you remember but that weird dynamite match that he had. It was a trios match in that trios title tournament. And then they Roosh beat him up afterward, unmasked him. Like that's his fucking brother. It was so random. And then WWE scooped him up a couple months later. I think he was in AAA, but uh, yeah, that, that, it's a very similar situation. But listen, they got Julia coming in at some point. They got Stephanie back here. You know, there's rumors of them signing. I mean, it's pretty obvious. Read the writing on the wall. They're going to be signing Jordan Grace at some point when she's done in TNA in 2025. I think in January is when her contract expires. So Shawn Michaels, he's, uh, he's cooking down there right now. So it's nice to see the women's division is in good hands for the foreseeable future. Um, back to the Raw stuff real quick, not really a Raw review, but I do have to ask you about this. We talked about Damien and Drew and, and Punk and that whole thing. Drew and Punk are obviously on a collision course, no pun intended, for SummerSlam. But where does that leave, uh, where does that leave Seth Rollins? Uh, we talked about that and you mentioned how the cash-in, you know, kind of reignited the feud with, with Punk and, uh, Rollins and, you know, that was already there, so it was pointless, but that's what it did and they had that great segment on Raw this week. There's been rumors like, does it turn into a triple threat? Is he a special guest ref? Is he off the show entirely? I real That's why I thought Rollins would win on Saturday, because I don't know what the fuck else you do with him. I, again, I know he's involved with Punk and McIntyre, but the match has got to be McIntyre and Punk, one and one at SummerSlam. So what do you do, Mr. Marceau, with Seth Rollins at SummerSlam? That's a great question. Um... I don't really know. I feel like we did when we were going over the review, we both, and similar with Jay, I feel like we we're like, they kind of should or need to win because without not win, if they don't win, what else are you going to do with them? And I feel like, like you said, it kind of reinvigorated him and Punk, but I mean, the story's Drew and Punk right now, so I don't really want Rollins to be intertwined in that. I feel like we need to get the one on one here. I said maybe a special guest referee. Um,. I just, I don't know. I feel like besides that, what else do you really do with Rollins right now specifically? So, I don't, I 
Tone wanted to be a triple threat, so I'm more down for the special guest referee, but I also feel like it doesn't really need to be there, so maybe Rollins isn't on the show. I don't know, because I feel like if not that, what else do you really do with him? So, interesting time, but I would say I want it one-on-one, so I would not put Rollins on it, unless he's the referee, I guess. Yeah, it really should be one-on-one. I would not do a triple threat. As the ref, that's fine, or maybe special guest enforcer. I know he'd be fucking pissed by that, because he's had a pretty great track record at SummerSlam over the years. Some really, really good matches, and I know he was mad when he was left off SummerSlam back in 2022 with uh, Riddle, and uh, they just had a brawl instead. He was on the show, but he didn't wrestle, and he was pretty pissed about that, so I, I can't imagine he would you know, want to come back from an injury only to find out he's not wrestling on the show, but... That would seem to make the most sense if he's a ref, because I don't really know what else you'd do with him unless it's a triple threat, which it shouldn't be, because Punk and McIntyre is the match to do after feuding for seven months. You, you're going to do having Punk cast uh, cost McIntyre three times and not do the singles match? That would make the money in the bank cash in even more of a way, so I certainly would not do that. Uh, but we also saw on Raw, at the end of the show, Mommy is back, Rhea Ripley returning, attacking, or not attacking, but she did confront Dominic Mysterio, Liv Morgan ran off. I've mentioned before, I know we've talked about it at length already, but they've done such a great job, I think, with the Liv Morgan, Dominic stuff. Um, you know, having Liv try to coerce Dominic and manipulate him, and now they were seemingly kind of getting into it, and that's when Rhea Ripley came out. So I thought it was perfect timing. Rhea's a great get for the division because she's been gone for three months, and that women's division could certainly use her. And this is the development this storyline needed to kind of push things along. So and it, it was a great cliffhanger because we didn't hear from Rhea. She didn't do anything. Left you waiting for what's going to happen next week. So your thoughts on the angle and Rhea Ripley being back and where we go from here. I don't know if you can hear the chef kiss from my mouth, but that's, <laughs> this is what this was. This was great. Um, I think what they've been doing with Liv has been amazing. People, oh, she's defending the title. Okay, I don't give a shit. She's had great story <laughs> work. So you know what? The great story work's going to make up for when, when AKA Rhea comes back, which she did on Raw. And like you said, didn't say anything. Liv kind of ran off, and they showed the thing on socials out there. She's kind of hanging behind the curtain, laughing. Like, this is perfect. Like, there's, this is literally perfect storytelling, mm-hmm. which then makes in for a great match or great feud. So... I loved it. I thought it was good. We didn't really hear from Rhea here. We haven't really heard from her since she left. Like, we've heard, like, the Judgment Day people, like, have you talked to Rhea? But besides that, we haven't actually heard from her. So, I think this leads a lot of possibilities. Obviously, seemingly get Liv and and Rhea at at SummerSlam, but we don't really know where Dom is. Like you said, he was kind of feeling it there, but then Rhea came out. So, we also have, like, the little back and forth between Finn and, and Damian. So, Judgment Day has a lot going on, and it's all interesting. So, um, I thought it was a perfect way to end Raw, and like I said, makes you want to tune in next week to see what, what happens. For sure. Everything's kind of peaking at the right time with a lot of these storylines, and um, you know, specifically with this Judgment Day stuff. I think they're doing a great job of keeping you interested from week to week. They set the stage perfectly for Liv and Rhea at SummerSlam for the Women's World Championship. I mean, you talk about special guest ref. They're not going to do two of the same match on the same show. But Dom being the ref makes more sense in this match than it does for Rollins being involved in Punk and McIntyre. Um, I, I can honestly see a situation where Dom aligns with Liv because he's blinded by immediate love from Liv, and then she dumps him a little bit later on. But I think that might that's might be where we're headed with this. I would not give Rhea the belt back as soon as SummerSlam. I think he could drag this on even further to kind of uh, make the most of it. Yeah, it's not like similar, but it's giving me like Jericho Christian yes. Trish Stratus vibes. Yeah. Obviously, it's a little bit different. Hopefully, not Ben and A pesos on this. Not Canadian dollar. <laughs> no peso. No peso, please. Yeah. But, uh, like you said, like custody of Dominic or Dominic is a special ref. Like you said, I feel like him as the ref and, you know, hits her with the riptide, hits the one, two, and he's hesitant, you know, doesn't want to. And then Liv beats Rhea, like you said, down the line. She dumps Dom. But, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm all in. I think this is one of the better storylines that they've done. I think it's made Liv. And they kind of finally tapped into, like, the Liv Crazy character. She's just, like, a manipulative mm-hmm. person. So, like, when they made her, like, oh, I'm extreme, it was kind of dumb. But now they've kind of fine-tuned the storyline that, like, she's just clearly using these people with her beauty and psychological analysis or whatever you want to yeah, call it, manipulative yeah. ability. So this is what the extreme crazy Liv is what we wanted, and they've done great, and... Like I said, I think she's got Dom Dom under her finger. I think so. It's it's great TV, so I'm looking forward to next week. Last two things for you, Mr. Marceau. Uh, WWE, you can add more uh, insight on this than I ever could. WWE hiring Joe Testori. Is that how you pronounce his name? 
Testory? What is it? Joe Tessitore. Tessitore. God, I'm fucking terrible. He's an ESPN analysis, an analyst rather, commentator too. Talk to me about it. I mean, I, I again, I texted you immediately. W- what's going on? It, obviously an optimistic signing because you were pretty on board with it. Yeah, I think he's just like your typical ESPN lead announcer for sports. I mean, I, I know he does football. I think he did a little hockey too. I mean, like I said, he's just your standard lead announcer, commentator. I mean, I think Trying to think who to compare him to. Trying to think who else they've had. Yeah, I mean, he's not really like anyone else they've really had because, like I said, he's kind of been like more of a lead. I guess like Jimmy Smith was similar just because obviously he was like a lead UFC commentator. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, Joe is, like I said, he's more of like your your standard, like Joe Buck. I don't know if you know that name, but like yeah, yeah. Your, your, standard, your standard fucking color guy, like Jim Nance, similar, I mean... Yeah, so, I mean, he's your standard sports lead commentator. I'm not sure exactly how that will translate to wrestling because it's obviously a little bit different. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, TV voice, I I don't think it could go wrong, but I guess we'll see. Uh, He's no Adnan Adnan Burke, I know that. (laughs) Okay. I mean, that was my number one question because they've had a couple different sports announcers in recent years. Uh, Not Vic Joseph, but the most recent one that they let go of. God, why can't I remember his name, but... Um, the fellow on SmackDown, they let go. They, they, what was his name? I don't remember. He was uh, the lead announcer of Raw. I know his face, and now I'm fucking terrible because I actually like this work. He was the interviewer. And then, what was his name? I don't remember. But he was the lead interviewer. Announcer. He was an interviewer, and then he turned into a commentator. The guy they just let go of earlier this year. He was the nice Kevin guy. Patrick. It's Kevin Patrick. Thank you. I like Kevin Patrick. Not a great commentator, but I like Kevin Patrick. He was a great interviewer. Um, he left on his own. He didn't really work out. He came from the sports world. Adnan Verk was fucking awful for Raw. <laughs> I did not like him at all. He was all of uh, he was good for all of six weeks when they let him go. I liked Jimmy Smith a lot, and then Triple H got rid of him when he took over, so whatever. Um, and he would mess up a lot. From what I understand, Joe is a wrestling fan, though. I, I believe he's a wrestling fan. They spoke about that in the press release. So you said he's a color guy, or is he play by play? You said lead announcer. He's, he's the lead play by. He's a play by play guy. Okay, he's the lead play by play. So if they're putting him on SmackDown with Corey, would Corey just go back to color? You think? Yes. Okay. And they said it's going to be a three man booth, obviously to kind of get him ready for you know to be in a two man booth. Uh, that doesn't bode well for Wade Barrett. I think of the two, Wade Barrett would probably get the boot at some point, which I hate to see. I don't know how Dude, that's going to work. Send him on NXT and get rid of Booker T. <laughs> Booker T is not great. That's the only positive light. They need to get rid of Booker T so bad. Like, it literally <laughs> makes me want to watch NXT on mute. He's so bad. I love Booker on commentary. He's a fucking mess. He's a mess. Every time the women come out, he just says the same things every time. It's just, dude, you got to calm down. What is what is Charmel thinking right now watching this? <laughs> Ridiculous. She's but, not. Uh, yeah, she's, she's not. not. That's, NXT, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, she's not. She has no idea. But, um, yeah, now I'm optimistic. From what you said, I'm looking forward to seeing what he adds to the show. I don't know if he debuts tomorrow. I mean, I would think, or I don't know. But they made the announcement the other day, so we'll see. Um, last thing here from Dynamite. I, I mean, I always bury Dynamite here, not as far as they're, they're doing bad stuff, but there's just not a whole lot to talk about. But on Wednesday, though, they did have their Owen Hart Cup winners crowned and Brian Danielson, which surprised me. I really thought it would be Adam Page. Uh, but Danielson is going to All In if they swerve Strickland for the AEW World Championship. And Mariah May won the women's one, which I expected, but she did turn on Tony Storm last night, and she will face Storm for the Women's World Championship at the All-In pay-per-view as well. So um, your thoughts on those two outcomes and what they set up for All-In next month? Yeah, I think when we discussed it at first, I didn't even know who was in the men's tournament <laughs> yeah. or the men, women, actually. And I think we both, you said Brian and, and Mariah. And, I mean, Mariah, I think, made the most sense for the women. Brian, when it came down to him and Paige, I was a little more up in the air, but I think Brian makes the most sense. I mean... He only has so much time left. I feel mm-hmm. like I think he mentioned that he won't be around that much longer. So him at Wembley against against Swerve here makes sense. Mariah and Tony, that's the story. Made sense here. At least it turning on Tony, seemingly. Uh, it was it looked like a pretty good ending on, on Dynamite. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think they both really made sense. Like I said, not like that's a bad thing. People think if it's predictable or it makes sense, it's a bad thing. But no, Brian... Winning made sense, and, and Mariah, I mean, the whole gimmick's based around her eventually turning on Tony, which we got last night, so um, no issues there. I think it should be both be two two good matches, so uh, good good on the on the AEW front. 
I agree. No, I, I really thought Paige would win because I thought we would get Paige and Swerve again at All In. I don't know what, really what you do with Paige now. I know he's in blood and guts in a couple weeks with the Elite um, just because Swerve joined Team AEW and he wants to get his hands on him. So I don't really know where that leaves Hangman. And I really wanted Brian and Nigel at, at, at London. I mean, people have asked, is he cleared? I, I don't know. I mean, he hasn't said he's not. Um, I thought that would be a great final match for the two of them. But I think Danielson's not done at All In. I think he's just having his last big match on that show at Wembley. But, you know, he won here and he's going to face Swerve. That should be good. And I thought the angle, you mentioned it there, um, it was a great ending. I mean, it was very similar to the one that MJF, him turning the week prior on Daniel Garcia, but not necessarily a bad thing. I thought this was great. And listen, for everyone that says AEW doesn't do stories, and they don't do nearly as much, nearly as many stories as WWE does, that is true. Um, they have told a great story with Mariah May and Tony Storm in the last eight, nine months. They've both been great. Mariah May specifically has been probably their best female signing, one of them ever, not even in the last couple of years. I think ever. She's been fantastic. So Angle was awesome. Great ending. Uh, perfectly set up. And uh, lots to look forward to. They're actually doing Osprey and MJF next week. They're not waiting until All In to do that match. They're having their first match next week on the show for the international title. I don't know if that sets up because Pac won a number one contenders match where he'll challenge the champion at some point. He teased All In. They didn't say that. So I don't know if he faces Osprey at that show and MGF faces Daniel Garcia. It seems like a lot's up in the air right now, but there's a lot of different directions they can go in. Yeah, I mean, seemingly I thought we were going to get Garcia and MGF at all in. I mean, I assume he comes out and costs MGF the belt. I mean, I don't see Osprey losing here. Mm-hmm. I mean, not that I'm overly excited for that for MGF. I feel like you do more with him, but they seemingly are all in on Garcia, so we'll see, but... Like I said, pro- I would assume we get Pack and Osprey at Wembley makes sense, and then you do seemingly Drew, uh, Daniel and, and MJF. So yeah. yeah, I could see that certainly happening. And maybe uh, listen, they throw in Ricochet in there somewhere. I think he's Ugh. definitely AEW bound. Well, what's the side there? You don't think he's going to? You don't want him to see him in AEW? I, I'm honestly ricocheted out for the points. So wow. I'm okay. Right now. Interesting. Listen, I was ricocheted out in WWE. I, I'm. I think him getting a fresh coat of paint in AEW will be. Uh, what's best for him. I mean, it's not going to be your cup of tea, but what I was going to say was, I think they might do Osprey Pack and Ricochet in a triple threat on that show. I could certainly see that. I think that'd be so amazing. You know the, gymnast- the gymnastics in, in Paris is in July, right? <laughs> well, listen, uh, let me say this. If they're going to do that match, it's going to be a great match. But let me tell you this. If Dave Meltzer goes on to give that seven stars, but it's going to go ahead and shit on Sol Rook and Kalani Jordan, then that's going to tell you all that you need to know. It's the same. I mean, listen, the men do it a little bit better because the women aren't as experienced. But for this specific example, but all of it is gymnastics. So, I mean, how can you shit on one but not shit on the other? You know what I mean? I mean, that's Uncle Dave for you. Yeah. I know you didn't see it. He still's got you blocked. So, I mean, I know you didn't see it. I didn't see it. I'm blocked. Sorry, guys. (laughs) Hey, listen, Shawn Michaels has me blocked. I didn't see his tweet about Stephanie Vakir. So, we're in the same boat here. We're we're all blocked by somebody. (laughs) Shawn Michaels, I praise NXT and I get blocked. I mean, I don't know what he. I don't think he even think it was him. I've mentioned this before. I think it was whoever handles his account. I don't know. I got to get him to unblock me one of these days. But we'll talk more next week. Here in Wrestle Rant Radio, new episodes, like I said, every single Thursday on all the usual podcast platforms. Rate, review, subscribe. All the support greatly appreciated. Mr. Marceau, brother, enjoy the weekend. I'll catch you next week, brother. All right, take care, man. Adios. Join Graham, GSM Matthews, and RJ Marceau every Thursday as they run down their weekly wrestling rants, offer expert analysis, host exclusive interviews, and more. Subscribe today on all your favorite podcast platforms and never miss an episode of Wrestle Rant Radio. Wrestle Rant Radio.